So this morning we continue our work through Acts chapter uh, through Acts, and we're, we're we're in chapter twenty. By the way, if I'm a little rambly this morning, I'm going to blame that on the pine trees. Uh, I'm, I've, I've kind of got pollen head, so if I actually float off of the stage, I apologize. Uh, I don't think I'll do that, but I don't know for sure. In fact, I'm not even certain I'm here. But anyway, uh, <laughs> this morning uh, we are in Acts chapter 20, and if you want to have your Bible in front of you, you can look at that. Uh, anybody know who this guy is? Have you ever seen David Copperfield before? He's not a bit as big a deal anymore. If you're under the age of uh, probably 40 or so, you may not know who this guy is. He was a real big deal back in the 1980s. When I was a kid, this guy was amazing. He was making all kinds of stuff disappear. You remember him? He made a jet disappear. You know, He was the guy who made the Statue of Liberty disappear. And he made it disappear. I saw it happen. I was watching TV, and my parents were like, there's no way he's going to be able to. You know, and here's the Statue of Liberty, and he had this elaborate set, you know, and the, and the big old curtain comes up, and he walked around like Michael Jackson for a few minutes, you know, and it was very big and exciting, and then it was gone. I mean, it was gone. I mean, it was gone. The Statue of Liberty was gone. It's kind of a big thing. You know, the Statue of Liberty. And you know what it was? That's right. <laughs> it was gone. Do you realize that the Statue of Liberty is roughly the size of the Statue of Liberty? <laughs> and he made it... I mean, it's huge gone. Now, I'm fairly certain that it actually was still there. I think. I don't know, man. Maybe it was gone. But I'm pretty certain that what he did was actually to kind of distract us somehow. David Copperfield was a master... Oh, sorry. How did he do that? Well, I'm pretty sure that how he did that was something called prestidigitation. Preston... Press the button. Press, <laughs> press the digitation. Sleight of hand. You know, I swear you, you, you say, look over there. Don't notice this. Press the digitation is where you're incredibly talented with your hands and you're able to make... Now, I'm not sure how he used his hands to make the Statue of Liberty, but I'm pretty sure that this is what he was doing to make things vanish. They weren't really going away. He was just making it seem like they were. Have you ever noticed how often a magician will have a lovely assistant? You realize that's not accidental, right? I mean, she's going to be beautiful, and she's going to be wearing sequins, and probably not enough of them. You know, and, and she's, she's going to be kind of a talented dancer who moves around a lot. Why is she doing that? Well, for at least half the audience... You know, he can be pretty sure where their eyes are going to be, right? You know, and the motion is distracting to the other. So they're going to be looking over at her, you know, while he's... You'll note that the magician will often point, nothing in my hand, right? And because, well, why was he doing this? Because he wants you looking here. He doesn't want you to see right here. He's going to direct your attention somewhere other than where he wants it to be or where he wants it to be instead of where he doesn't want you looking, right? Because the dove or the rabbit or whatever is actually coming out over here. But you're, you're looking, and boy, when someone points, you know, don't you feel like you need to look where they're pointing? I mean, it just immediately, hey, well, let's, let's try this. <laughs> How many of you did it, you know? I mean, you, you, we look, and, and he's directing our attention. He's distracting us. He's making, and, and while we're distracted, it says uh, tricks of the trade. When you, when you are looking, when they are looking, punch them in the neck. That's what that says. Which is what, you know, as you will. I just came across that and thought it was entirely too funny. Uh, it's not a magician. Anyway, there are also moments from which you cannot look away. 
that are just so powerful and potent you don't want to look away, right? Like, for in, that are just beyond distraction. They're too significant. They're too important. Like, for instance, you don't want to look away while you're sewing. You know, if you have a sewing machine, that needle's going, like, what, 70 miles an hour up and down, right? It will go through your bone. Don't, you don't want to know how I know that. So you don't want to look somewhere else. It's too important to be distracted. If a thing is of a great enough significance, I don't care if they drop the bomb. I'm not going to look away. Moments like, like this one. First day of first grade. I'm going to need a minute. <laughs> How many of you think I took my eyes off of that moment? Even for a second. Even for a second. Or your kid is crossing a busy street. Do you look away? And you're probably holding their hand, right? Or how about this moment? I tell you where to look during this moment. Don't look at the back. She's coming. You'll see her in a minute. Look at the groom. That moment only lasts a second. But it's amazing. That moment when the groom sees his bride. You know, I pray often for Jesus to come back. I hope I get to see his face when he sees his bride. I just want to see his face. You don't take your eyes off the face of the groom because that moment is there for a moment, but it's there for eternity inside of his heart. If he's wise, he cultivates and remembers that expression even though he himself never saw it. And he locks that up because it's too important to become distracted. I'll tell you where you don't look is it the, the face of the dad. <laughs> Not unless you want your heart broken into pieces, you know. There are moments that are simply too important to be distracted from. And I don't care what magician is pulling what tricks. I don't care where the fingers are pointing. I will not look away. Right? In the story that we look at this morning, there are some pretty big distractions. But what is fascinating is that from which they do not look away. That even with the dramatic and amazing, something a bigger deal than the Statue of Liberty, by the way, do you know that it was gone? A bigger deal than that. A more amazing thing than that, because it's real. Even then, they will not look away from some things. Let's, let's look at it with them. If you've got your Bibles, it's Acts chapter 20, uh, beginning in verse 7. It says, In the first day of the week, when they were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, uh, intending to part the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. And if I might just say so, I don't intend to do that today, but I'm not sure that he intended to either. So, <laughs> Man, funny in my head. Moving on. Uh, there were many lamps in the room. Odd distraction there. And where they were gathered, a young man named Utica sitting in the window sank into a deep sleep, and Paul talked still longer. It goes on and on about how long the Apostle Paul preached. I'd just like to point out, if I ever go long, I am merely emulating Paul. Anyway, uh, and he, fell, uh, he began to be overcome by sleep, and he fell down from the third story, and the window was taken up dead. Paul went down and bent over him, say, uh, and talking to him, taking him in his arms. This was just red. I'm going to go ahead and move on. Uh, but the, uh, the, the story, they bring him back from the dead, and then they go up and they finish their church. I mean, do you think the people who are there ever told that story again? I suspect those people told that story over and over and over. I had a roommate in college, and I, I have like a repertoire of stories, you know. And uh, when I was in college, I was younger, so my repertoire was smaller. And, uh, you know, we lived together for about a year and a half. And, uh, and there was one time that I said to Jay, I said, Hey, Jay, did I ever tell you about the time? He said, Yes. <laughs> now that you're probably right. Uh, I suspect these people were like that with this story. Did I ever tell you that? that time? Especially Eutychus. Do you think they could get him to shut up about it? I bet they couldn't. I bet he was telling this story all the time. It's kind of a big deal, isn't it? I mean, it's huge. 
uh, especially this part of the story, and this is cut out from the middle, a young man named Utica sitting in the window. Uh, this was actually a photograph shot with a drone because it's on the third floor, you know, and there when they shoot the, go to the well again and again, you know, and, uh, and so he falls out of the window. Don't, this is the story they tell over and over again, don't you think? Because the rest of it they do all the time. This didn't happen all the time. This is kind of a big deal. So I bet you they told the story of that time that Eutychus fell out the window. And the big point of the scripture here is that sleeping in church is deadly. You know? I, uh, I, when I, the first per church I ever preached, well, second church I ever preached at, there was this guy who sat right where Ethan is. I kid you not, right there. And I always did the announcements before the sermon, and I'd get done with my announcements, and, and my, we're going to go into the sermon now. My phrase was, open your Bibles this morning too. And through the announcements, he'd be... And I'd say, open your Bibles this morning, too. And he... <laughs> it was like Pavlovian, you know? I just shut off the switch, and down he went. And I kept waiting for him to fall. You know, I really... You know, because I wanted to do this. You know, and, and anyway. Don't do that. It's, that's not the point of this. You know, but when he... Actually, uh, the big reason I put this picture up here is because I love this expression <laughs> are you kidding me <laughs> anyway moving on so this is kind of a big deal don't you suppose there was some excitement and I don't mean yay excitement not playground excitement like oh no I suspect his parents were present the, the word used for a young man is between the ages of 9 and 13. That's how they use that phrase. You know, that's my little Isaac there. You know, taking a tumble out of the window. Precious, precious guy. And you know the second he goes out, he's gone. He's gone. I, I suspect this was kind of exciting in a terrible way. And when they get down there, they find him, and he's dead. I suspect that some of him was spread out. You know, they've got a mess when they get there. I bet they're holding the mom back. You know, you don't, you don't need to see this, Eutychus' mom. You don't need to look at that. And yet, when Paul gets to him, he throws himself down on him in, the, in kind of the behavior of Elijah with the widow and the widow's son and he throws himself down on him and then he takes him up he's alive now there's probably another kind of excitement don't you think i mean this is a big deal this is a significant distraction at least one would think one would think that whatever you're doing would kind of give way to this that this is all that you would pay attention to when you think on the first day of the week, when I, this, is the, this is the stuff they choose to pay attention to instead. Because they can't keep their eyes off of this. They won't take their eyes off of this. On the first day of the week, he says, when we gather together to break bread, Paul talked with them. That's what this story for the early church is about. A resurrection happened. The dead came to life again. But what we concentrate on is these things. Which things? These. On the first day of the week. Now why is that a big deal? The text actually tells us in the previous verses that Paul stayed where he was so that he could be with them on the first day of the week. Why? Well, because that, that's the day when something kind of important happened. That's the day when something a little significant took place when the dead began to come back to life. When the dead Lord came back to life and then the pause button got pushed. But the resurrection began in the middle of time. The end of time event happened here. The resurrection of the Lord. It'll happen to all of us, but it happened here in the middle of time to let us know that it's coming. And when did it happen? This day. This day is when it happened. And why do we get together on Sunday? Because this happened this day, and it's too important to be distracted from. 
There are so many fingers in this world pointing so many directions. Look over here. Satan is always pulling the rabbit out and the rabbit is rabid and has really big teeth and is from that Monty Python movie and it wants to bite off your head. You know, that's Satan and he's always pulling it out but he's making you look over here and he's got you fooled and he's got you distracted and your heart and your mind is stuck in grief and trouble and pain and you're trapped in sin and he says don't look at that whatever you do so every first day of the week we come together and we look at that we remember what happened we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Paul stayed where he was for seven days so that he could do this. Because that's important. And it's too important to be distracted from. What did they do when they did this? When we gathered together to break bread. Now, that sounds like they got together to have a potluck, and I suspect that they did. I think that they ate a meal with the practice that this describes. But that's not talking about a potluck. Paul will use the words Lord's Supper. Luke will use the words break bread. It's the same thing. Paul's talking about the breaking of that bread. So they, when did, what did they get together for? They got together on Resurrection Day to remember His death and resurrection. They gathered together to break bread. And I want you to notice this. It gets mentioned in the text twice. You got when they gather together to break bread, and then Eutychus falls and dies and is brought back to life. And then, and when Paul had gone up, so he walks back upstairs. Why? To break bread. They hadn't done it yet, and he wanted to make sure they did it. Right? So you have a death and resurrection in the middle of your church service, but we haven't done the Lord's Supper yet. We better do that. So they head back up. You know, Eutychus, we love you. Promise. But we've got something important to do. Now pass the food. And that's how big a deal this is. That even though there's a death and resurrection in the middle of their church service, they are not distracted from the Lord's Supper. Folks, there's a message in that. A huge one. There is so much in this life that threatens to distract us from the death and resurrection of Jesus. But we need to realize that's what our lives are about now. If we are followers of Jesus, then that's the center of our lives, and we need to come back to it again and again and again. Always. Not just on Sunday, but especially when we come together to do this. We come together to do this so that we can do it when we need to, when we're threatened, when we're harmed. We have to remember that God was faithful to Jesus and raised Him from the dead. I don't have to attack or hurt. I don't have to do harm to anybody else because I'm a person marked by the breaking of bread. I don't have to lie to anybody to deceive anybody because I'm a person marked by the breaking of bread. I don't have to do anything to, to seek my own way because I'm a person marked by the breaking of bread. And I will not be distracted. No matter what Satan throws at me, I come back here. This is why we do it every first day of the week. It is too important not to. We are creatures that are easily distracted. Easily distracted. Here, let me show you. Let me show you. I've got a, right here, this is a halls. Watch this. I can just make this thing disappear into my, oh, nuts. Hang on. <laughs> my bad. Okay, all right. So I can make this thing disappear. See, because what it was is, is that I, I, I rubbed right here, and then it went and it came out of Ethan's ear. See, <laughs> it's easy to be distracted. It's not a hard thing to distract human beings. We need the reminder. It's why the Lord gave us something tangible to pull us again and again back to the cross. Back to remember that I have been called to a cross. Back to remember that I am supposed to trust God like He trusted God. That I'm supposed to remember that His blood is poured out for the remission of my sins. And I'm not living in them anymore. 
I need the reminder. And I will not be distracted. Not even if something amazing happens. They aren't going to... Where did I put the clicker? They aren't going to be distracted by it. It's too important. And... Oh, I made this point already. This is the meal that they're taking. They're remembering the meal given to them by the Lord to remind them of Himself. He is too important to forget. And Paul talked with them. Too important to be distracted from. You'll note that in terms of time, they gave a whole lot of time to this. I mean, he, he talked until after midnight. And he went on and on and on. And the text even makes a point. Man, he was long-winded that night. I tell you what. Why is this? Because the Word of God pulls us to God. The reason we need to hear this again and again and again, the reason we need these sermons, even if they're unbearably long, is because we need the Word of God. And it's too important to be distracted. You'll notice that after Eutychus falls, when they come back up, Paul keeps talking. You'd like to think that that would be such a huge big deal that he wouldn't be able to anymore. They'd be stunned by it. No, he kept on in the Word of God. Because he's planning to leave tomorrow and he doesn't have any more time. He's got to give these people what he's got. So he's setting them into the Word. Why? Because the Word is God's agent for the redemption of our lives. Word and table, folks. The Word of God that we sing to one another. The Word of God that we dwell in when we read. The Word of God that is preached. And the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing more significant than these because they lead us into the resurrected life. They lead us into, into life that we would never find on our own. And they lead us away from all those things that distract us that ought not. It is the Word of God. And they won't take their eyes off it because they know it's a sewing machine world. If you stop paying attention, you get hurt. And they don't want that. Not for themselves, not for their kids, not for each other. They want to be whole. And so their focus is where it needs to be. This is Christian worship, folks. They would not be distracted from the breaking of bread or the proclamation of the Word. They wouldn't take their eyes off it. Because it was the first day of the week and that was resurrection day. It was the Lord's day. And it was the day to remember the resurrection and that God is at work by His power among us. And we got to focus here because Monday's coming and Monday's hard. Monday, the man in the suit with the top hat shows up. Or the cane, pitchfork, and the bifurcated tail. He comes with His wickedness to point in other directions and to pull us away. And I need my eyes focused on God. It's too important to be distracted. So every Lord's Day, they do it. It's worth noting that the miracle is one of resurrection and what was being proclaimed with bread and word? Resurrection. Maybe it wasn't, this one wasn't such a distraction after all. Perhaps it even helped them to focus upon what they were doing. Which was particularly important for Paul because the story is shifting now, folks. Paul is headed into Jerusalem, the city that killed his Lord. He's headed there and he knows the trouble waits for him there. Will he be able to be faithful? Well, it depends. Is he distracted? There are all kinds of things that distract us. Angers, sins, hatreds, uh, troubles, pains, being arrested, put in chains, mobs, riots. All kinds of things can distract this guy. No. No, the resurrection in the middle of that Lord's Supper, I think, helped him to remember, okay, I follow a Lord that is stronger than any of this. And I keep my heart and mind focused on this. It's probably a good idea, don't you think? Maybe you and I should be doing the same. The repeated, regular, sustained worship of God keeps us focused upon God and His will. And folks, it's too important to let yourself be distracted by anything. How are you doing with this? Do you have a focused mind, focused heart? Is it set on the resurrection? Are you living with resurrection ethics? Are you living a resurrection lifestyle? 
Or do you focus on resurrection when you come here maybe a little bit and then go out and there's got nothing to do with how you live? I don't expect that from any of you, but I challenge you with it. Because that's what the text is doing. It is calling us to a focused life. And the focus is right here. Right here. Focus on the Word and the table. And the power of what it does in our lives. Are you focused? Is your heart and your mind set on resurrection? If you look into your life and you see it's filled with fear or pain or distrust or anger or hate or sin of any kind, then chances are you need to refocus. Don't be distracted. Let the Lord Jesus be the center of your heart. And if you need the prayers of the people of God in order for that to happen, let us know. We want to pray for you. And if I talked about stuff that has nothing to do with what's going on in your life, but you're hurting and you want the church to pray for you, again, let us know. We want to do it. If this morning you're subject to the invitation of Christ, there's room right here. Why don't you come while we stand up and sing?